Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class on First, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Uh, just a warm welcome also to all our uh, e-learning students as well. So welcome, e-learning students. Uh, before we begin our class this morning, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Shall I pray? Yes, thank you, Abini. Father God, we are so very thankful to you for another day that your mercies are renewed every morning. And this morning also, as we are sitting in your presence, Father, we want to thank you for a new day, for everything that you make new in our lives, Father. And we want to thank you for this time of learning. Lord, we surrender ourselves and we yield to the Holy Spirit as we learn how to how to interpret your word, how to understand your word, Father, and whatever you have for us today, may each one of us receive that Rema word. May we understand what you have for us, Father, and may we be able to interpret the word in such a way that we are able to, uh, Lord, pass it on to others with gladness, with joy, with confidence that our Lord is the one who has given us this alive word, which works in the lives of people, and, and Lord, that many should and love you, Father, and come to you, Father, in the way you want to lead us, Father. Lead us today, anoint pastor, anoint all the all the students who are in, Father, and who would be hearing this uh, lecture, Lord, Father, later. We pray that your word shall continue to grow in us and help us and guide us to follow your footsteps and do what you have, uh, you have accomplished in us and, Father, you want us to do. We want to thank you once again for how you lead us and how you... Uh, love us, Father. Thank you for who you are and thank you for all the blessings of life. We give you glory, honor, and praise and ask this prayer in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, last week we were uh, studying First Timothy chapter 1. Uh, we came up from uh, verses 1 to verse 17. Uh, we look at verses 18 to 20. Basically, in chapter 1, uh, Paul is uh, giving Timothy, young Timothy, who he has uh, left at uh, uh, Ephesus, the city of Ephesus, to oversee the churches uh, as a spiritual overseer, uh, giving um, you know guidance and leading the churches there. Um, and Timothy is, young Timothy is facing hardships and he wants to come back uh, to Paul, be with Paul, minister along with him. And uh, so, you know, uh, in this uh, first chapter, he's giving him uh, various uh, reasons uh, why he wants uh, young Timothy to remain in uh, uh, Ephesus. So, uh, you know, uh, in was uh, in was uh, 17 you know 16 and 17 he gives him another reason uh, why he needs to continue to remain in Ephesus he gives him a description of who God is uh, and um, he's saying that you know uh, uh, God is king he's eternal he's immortal invisible the only wise God and because he is uh, this and because this is his nature and attributes. Uh, he's saying, you know, stay there, remain in Ephesus, because considering the greatness of the God who you who, who has called you, uh, who you are serving, uh, and this great God uh, was worthy of Timothy's sacrifice, and uh, this great God uh, who uh, Paul just breaks out in praise, uh, you know, will empower young Timothy for uh, his service, even as he serves and ministers uh, uh, God in uh, the city of Ephesus. And then he goes on to give him another reason in verses 18 to 20. So can one of you please read um, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, please? Yes, Asha. This I wish to charge and for you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenus and Alexander, 
whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may not, they may learn not to bless it. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So in verse 18, Paul is telling Timothy, this charge I commit to you. So this the Greek word for charge here is the same uh, that he uses in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, which I also mentioned when we were, uh, you know, studying First Timothy chapter uh, 1, verse 3, uh, that this Greek word, actually this ancient Greek word uh, of charge, it is a military word, which is referring to uh, uh, an order that is given by a commanding officer. So, you know, uh, when a commanding officer uh, is giving an order, there is, you know, no choice about it. You can't choose. You uh, you can't uh, do what you want. You just have to do the, you know, follow the order that has been given to you. So he's saying, you know, uh, this charge or this command I give to you as a commanding officer, you know, so he's uh, giving him this charge. He's committing him to him again, this charge, this order, and uh, to remain in Ephesus, to oversee the churches there, to continue to work in um, Ephesus and bring things in order in the churches of uh, Ephesus. He says, you know, I charge the charge I commit or entrust to you, Timothy, my child. So even as uh, Paul is, um, uh, you know, giving this order, you know, uh, to young Timothy, uh, and it looks like, you know, Paul is a commanding officer, but, you know, he's being uh, strict or he's enforcing something and all but he's also at the same time using words uh, or bringing in a relationship which is so beautiful so here he's saying i'm commanding you as a commanding officer giving you this order uh, but you know the other side he's saying you are my child you know and i'm giving you this com this command or this order not as somebody who's uh, above you or superior to you, uh, an apostle who's greater, a commanding officer, but, you know, uh, as a father telling a child, giving a, a child the order. So he's saying, you know, this I charge, this charge and trust you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made uh, uh, about you. So according to the prophecies, you know, God had spoken to uh, Timothy through others, through the gift of prophecy. So Paul wanted Timothy to consider what the Holy Spirit had uh, spoken to him, said to him through others in the past, and to receive courage and to receive encouragement from those prophecies that were spoken over his life and use that prophecies that were spoken over him uh, to remain in uh, Ephesus. And he says these words of prophecies, you know, uh, may have been a, a, a description of Timothy's or the, the prophecies that Timothy received, uh, uh, you know, would have been a description of Timothy's future ministry. It can also be a warning against him being timid uh, in his work for God, uh, but whatever uh, prophecy that he has received, you know, uh, Paul is writing this and reminding him to draw strength. You know, he says, this is what God wants you to do from those prophecies, draw strength from it uh, in your present uh, difficulties. So even, you know, we receive a lot of uh, prophecies what people speak over our lives uh, some things can be applicable at that moment some things we do not know why it was spoken at that moment but you can write down those prophecies and you know when you go through those situations whatever it may be in the future uh, you know, you can go back, read those prophecies, and you can uh, speak that over your life. And, uh, you know, you can see the word of God uh, come through in your uh, life. It's just amazing. Okay. Uh, so he's saying that, you know, these, these words of prophecies, uh, you know, uh, uh, that were spoken over his life, whatever it for whatever reason it could be it could be for his ministry future ministry uh warning him not to be timid fearful uh whatever it is but you know just draw strength uh from it uh, uh from the prophecies that were spoken over his uh life paul refers again to these prophecies uh, later on his in his letter in chapter four uh, of 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14 where he says uh, do not neglect the gifts that is given uh, that is in you which was given to you by prophecy uh, with the laying on of hands of the 
eldership. So maybe, you know, uh, he was a uh, anointed, appointed, uh, called to uh, to serve, to minister, uh, uh, you know, uh, into full time ministry or uh, to be a missionary, whatever you know. When the elders laid their hands on Timothy, so he says, "Don't neglect that gift. You've been given this gift of, uh, you know, of ministering, of serving God, of being this missionary or evangelist, whatever the calling was." For Timothy, you know, uh, don't neglect that uh, gift which was given to you by uh, by prophecy, the laying on of hands of the elders. And in Second Timothy chapter one verse six, which is uh, Paul is again uh, referring to the prophecies. Uh, that was spoken over uh, Timothy. He says in First and Second Timothy chapter one verse six. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my uh, hands. So, uh, even as Paul laid on his hands and spoke over his life, so he says, you know, be uh, uh, remind yourself of those things and fan into flames, you know, the gift of God which is in. Uh, you and then he goes on to say that you know uh, uh, that by them you may wage the good warfare so by uh, uh, by them he's talking about the prophecies uh, you know and the focus is not on the prophetic word that Timothy heard in the past but the focus now is on the battle that is right in front of him uh, presently so you know he's facing a difficult situation he's facing a battle and he's saying focus on your battle and use the prophetic word that was spoken over you to wage a good uh, warfare that is you know he uh, the KJV says fight the good fight so as a soldier you know he needs to fight the good fight so timothy had a, a job in front of him uh you know it was a, a job that he had was he was in the battlefield right in in the thick of the battle uh, it's not it was not going to be easy for him it's not going to be comfortable uh you know uh, or carefree but he had to approach this whole assignment that was handed over to him, this responsibility, this job that Paul had left him to do in Ephesus. Uh, you know, he had to do it as a soldier who was approaching uh, the battle. Um, and, you know, as a soldier who approaches the battle, he does not desert his post. He does not leave his post and run away because of the fierce battle or uh, the difficulty the uh, the soldier is uh, facing you know he does not leave at the battlefield and run away uh, but he faces the battle he fights uh, till the end and so uh, you know uh, uh, Paul is giving Timothy still another reason why he needs to uh, remain in Ephesus and the reason is that he should uh, sense this responsibility to stay you know, uh, where uh, God has called him to, the, the responsibility that God has entrusted to him, uh, where Paul has left him uh, to oversee the churches at Ephesus because uh, he's a soldier. You know, he's like a soldier in a battle, and a soldier in a battle does not desert his post, does not give up his position, but he fights till the end. So Paul is reminded, reminding young Timothy, don't uh, leave, remain there like, and be like a soldier, you know, who does not desert his uh, post. In verse 19, uh, you know, Paul uh, mentions uh, two tools of uh, warfare. There are two tools of warfare that he mentions in verse 19. One is faith and the other is of a good conscience. So saying having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have, have suffered shipwreck. So you know, faith and a good conscience are essential when uh, battling uh, facing spiritual battles uh, uh, you know they protect us against spiritual attacks of doubt and condemnation so very important uh, tools that we have for uh, warfare is faith and a good conscience uh, because they protect us against spiritual attacks of doubt and uh, condemnation so timothy had to have faith what was the faith and paul has already given him uh, you know, uh, a good um, a description of who he needs to put his faith on, uh, you know, faith in this God who is eternal, invisible, immortal, the only wise God, you know, and he says this God is in control, 
and this God would guide uh, 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 Timothy in uh, in everything that he has to do, uh, even as he continues to remain in Ephesus. He's saying, just continue to seek God, and He will continue to guide you because God is in supreme control. He's sovereign, you know. And the second thing, uh, second tool He gives for His warfare is a good conscience. So basically, a good conscience is uh, living right before. Uh, God and man, uh, you know, when we do away with the good conscience, uh, we do things that our conscience says is uh, are wrong as well, you know. Uh, and then when we do things that are wrong as well, uh, you know, uh, we will make a shipwreck of our faith and it will ultimately destroy our own faith. So the importance of good conscience. It's important for us to have a good conscience uh, because, you know, if we do uh, things that our, uh, our conscience tells us is not right, is wrong, we still go ahead and do it, then it will, you know, ultimately lead to shipwrecking of our faith or destroying our own uh, faith, you know. Uh, and Paul is reminding Timothy that he has to have a good conscience because you know he's young and there are you know people who are ready to attack him there are older leaders or uh, you know deacons in the church who are much older to him people in the church who are older even younger people you know they would just attack him or these false teachers would just uh, you know attack him and if Timothy had not con does not conduct himself rightly, then they would have a good reason to continue with their um, attack. So a good conscience is actually connected with a good conduct or translates into a good conduct. It's seen in the way that we act. It's seen in a good conduct, the way that we live our uh, lives. And Paul says, gives us gives him an example of how some people, you know, who have not used these tools of faith uh, or have not used this tool of good conscience, they have given themselves to doing things that are wrong, uh, and that has ultimately shipwrecked their faith and destroyed their own faith. And, uh, you know, he says some have rejected uh, these weapons, which some have rejected. So he's talking about two people who have rejected these weapons. And uh, specifically, you know, Paul speaks of them rejecting their faith and their good conscience. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, and he names them as Hymenius and uh, Alexander. These two people have rejected the tools for warfare. And he says that, you know, he has delivered uh, them to Satan that they may learn not to uh, blasphemy. So Hymenius uh, is also mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 17, where he's mentioned in connection with Philetus, uh, uh, as, and he's mentioned as a very dangerous man. Uh, there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, you know, one of the doctrines that Hymenius was promoting was that the resurrection had already uh, taken place. It was already passed. Uh, it it uh, seems that they were teaching that, uh, you know, uh, that people are already in God's millennium kingdom, uh, and there is, uh, you know, no more resurrection to come or to take place. It had already occurred. So they were teaching this wrong doctrines. So he's saying, uh, you know, how Hymenius, uh, you know, uh, rejected the tools of warfare, of faith and a good conscience, and how it has shipwrecked his faith and led him to uh, preach and teach wrong uh, doctrines. The other person that uh, Paul mentions here is Alexander. Uh, he also speaks about uh, Alex and other uh, and Alexander, uh, who refers he who, whom he refers to as Alexander the coppersmith in Second Timothy chapter four, verse fourteen, and uh, there he mentions this uh, Alexander the coppersmith as someone who did much evil uh, to Paul. So it's. Uh, co uh, Commentary writers, commentators say that it's possible that this is the same Alexander that uh, Paul is referring to uh, here in First Timothy chapter one, uh, and um, you know Paul says that he handed over both these men uh, to Satan. Now Paul did something similar, uh, uh, which he writes in First Corinthians chapter five. Uh, there, uh, he, uh, you know, uh, in the church at Corinth, there was a man who was uh, living a sexually immoral life. Um, 
you know, and the church was not doing anything about it. Uh, so uh, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and in First Corinthians chapter five, we, verse five, he says, "Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the uh, flesh." Uh, but I like what he also writes uh, in the latter half of that verse, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So, you know, Paul is not being cruel or rude or, uh, you know, shunning people away who are living in sin because they are the people who need uh, to experience more of the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, to be able to see their sin, uh, to be able to be reconciled back to God, acknowledge their sin and be reconciled back to God. So, uh, but Paul is doing this uh, with a specific intent so that, you know, uh, people, once they are excommunicated, which means once they are put out of the fellowship. So Paul is saying, you know, hand them over to Satan means, you know, um, get them out of the church, the fellowship, which is, which means that they are no longer under the spiritual oversight uh, of the church leadership. They're no longer under the spiritual covering or protection of uh, God. And when uh, they are in that stage, in that position, you know, um, uh, they're, they're not in the church, they're not under the spiritual covering uh, uh, of God. They are, uh, you know, in the world, they are open to uh, Satan's attack. His, they're, uh, they're open to, they're in Satan's world, his domain, so to say, his rule, his reign. And when they are tormented, when they go through problems and difficulties, because we know that Satan uh, is all out to steal, kill and destroy. And when they are tormented, when they go through difficulties, you know, uh, because they no longer have the protection of God over them or they're not under the spiritual oversight of the spiritual of the church leadership, you know, they will come to their senses. They will re realize what they're doing is wrong and, you know, it can lead them back to God, uh, you know, uh, to acknowledge their sin, to be reconciled back to God. So that's why he says, you know, for the destruction of the flesh. So basically he's saying that their fleshly carnal nature will be destroyed uh, and, you know, that their spirit, so that their spirit may be saved on the day of the uh, Lord. So uh, this is another reason that, uh, one more reason that Paul gives uh, Timothy to remain in Ephesus. Uh, what is the reason he's saying, you know, you should do this because not everyone else does it. There are many people like Alexander and Hymenius who've deserted the faith, who shipwrecked their faith, who left their faith. Uh, so not everyone is able to stand strong. Uh, so you don't be somebody who just leaves and runs away. Uh, but you need to uh, remain faithful to the end um, and don't uh, give up, but continue to uh, do what God has called you to, where he's posted you, what he has entrusted you to do. Okay. So Elisha says that today uh, we suspend people and have taken them off the church leadership. Can we still pray and offer some counsel to them? Yes, we can. Uh, we can still do that. We can still love them. We can still uh, care for them, show compassion, still pray for them, yes, uh, and help them out. Why do we basically, uh, why does it come to a place where we, uh, you know, send people out of uh, churches because they're bringing strife or division and uh, disunity uh, in the body of Christ in that specific ministry? So it's better for them to, you know, just tell them, hey, don't tell them, you know, or get out of church, or don't come back to church, or we don't want you to be attending our church. Just tell them, you know, just take a break of a month or two months or three months, you know, and then you can come back and join church, think about things, uh, you know, just spend time with God. We'll just be praying for you. And at the same time, just keep calling, ministering to them, helping them out. Yes. When it comes to serious issues, but when it comes to issues like, uh, you know, uh, Im sexual immorality and all, we can still have people in church help, help them unless it's, it's something really grievous and bad, has to do with another church member, which is going to bring about confusion in the church and things like that, then just get them both to, you know, be aside, lay aside, 
and just keep ministering to them, get another sister to minister to the lady, get another man to uh, minister to them, uh, to the, the male and, you know, help them out. Yes. Okay, so that is the end of chapter one. So Paul is uh, basically giving him some good reasons to remain in Ephesus. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, young Timothy was was uh, challenged, uh, was encouraged and continued to uh, remain in Ephesus and continue to do the work there. Any questions on chapter one? Any questions on chapter one? Yes, say. I don't know if my question is out of this class, but, but I was just thinking, is there a relationship between what Timothy was going through? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, say, I didn't, I didn't hear you from, hear you from the, the, the beginning. beginning. Can, can you? Can you? Can you hear me more? Yes, uh, a little bit. Yes, a little bit. Oh, okay. So I, I was just saying that I think my question might be out of this class, but I was just wondering if there was a connection between of the church of ephesus described in revelation chapter one and then what timothy was going through as a leader i don't know if there's any connection to that or was this years 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 after timothy was the leader of the church yeah, uh, yeah. good question, uh, good question. Uh, so uh, uh, we, uh, yes, Timothy was left uh, in Ephesus to oversee the churches there, but it was not just the churches at Ephesus, but also the surrounding area. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the challenges he was basically facing was, uh, you know, uh, the teaching of wrong doctrines, which he had to correct, bring in church administration, order uh, in the church, uh, you know, establish things. So it could have, also, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, included the seven churches uh, that were surrounding Ephesus that was is mentioned in uh, Revelation. Yes, could be. Thank you, Pastor. So, in, in other words, he was more like a bishop overseeing not just the church in Ephesus, but all the other surrounding churches, I guess? Yes, he was yeah, actually... He was actually Uh, he was overseeing uh, the churches, not only in the city of Ephesus, but also uh, the churches that are mentioned. A possibility is there because the churches were started when, uh, you know, those seven churches were started by people who were ministered and trained uh, uh, by Paul when he was uh, doing his ministry for three years at Ephesus, teaching in that Tyrannus Hall, you know, people who went out, his co-laborers, people were trained there and started those churches. So it was kind of connected to uh, the churches of uh, at Ephesus. And so, yes, you know, Paul would also have required a uh, young Timothy to oversee the churches. So the responsibilities were uh, really huge and big considering there were so many churches in Ephesus and also the surrounding areas. Uh, and also he was young, you know, people were there were much mature grown up uh, the false teachings and doctrines and it was uh, very difficult for uh, timothy so could be a possibility yes thank you Pastor. thank you say anyone else any questions okay if there are no questions so we'll move on to chapter two uh so if um, you know if one of you could please uh, open up to or well, all of you can please open up to first timothy uh, chapter 1 uh, chapter 2 And just uh, quickly read verses 1 to 15. I'll just give you a couple of minutes. And then maybe, uh, you know, we will just uh, look at each verse. Okay, so all of you can quietly just open up your Bibles. Uh, read First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. And then we would uh, study that in detail. And if you finish reading, you can just uh, indicate 
the chat section that you're done and then uh, we'll proceed. Okay, First Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 1 to 15. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and, and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and them, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle. I am, I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, and doubting in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with with propriety and moderation not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing but which is proper for women professing godliness with with good works let a woman lean in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you very much for reading that scripture passage. Uh, so I'll just open up this time for uh, any of you all to share uh, something that really touched your heart, something that leapt out of scripture, just ministered to you, uh, some truth that you learned uh, previously when you were Know, something that God administered to previously when you were reading First Timothy chapter 2, you heard a sermon, uh, something that really ministered to your heart. So just open up this time for you all to share. If you have any questions about the understanding of any verse, then we will do that, you know, as we study uh, each verse. And then if you still have questions, then I can answer that. But uh, now I'll just open this time up for you to share something that God has impressed in your heart. Uh, something that he's spoken to you, something that came like a rhema word. Just like to share something, anyone? Okay, I want. I have. Um, I have a concern so much about um, First Timothy chapter two, and that's about um, the role of men and women in church. And if we look at today, women are really playing most of the roles of men. So, and if we want to look by what First Timothy chapter 2 is saying, then we want to say that it is wrong. So in this case, what are we supposed to be saying? Are we going to be saying that it is wrong or it is right? So that's my question, yes. and it's something that I'm not in a hurry to answer myself that question, but to allow the leading of the Spirit, you know, to just take control. Because even if we say, okay, let the men, you know, do what they ought to do, we still get issues, and we still see women, you know, being used by God, you know, to do the things, you know, that are meant to be done. So, but if we want to follow what First, Tim uh, First Timothy chapter two is saying, then I wonder what the whole um, thing will look like. So my question here now is, okay, from what we have in um, First Timothy chapter two, 
what are we going to say in our present time when it comes to the role of men and women in church? Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. So by the end of, uh, uh, even as we do an exegetical study, a word study, uh, go through chapter two, you'll be able to answer that question. You'll have uh, more clarity on that. Uh, Kennedy says, uh, we strive to live a peaceable life and submission to headship and authority. Yes. Thank you, Kennedy. Mangi says, men pray everywhere. Yes, Mangi. So get men together to pray. Yes, Divya. Yes, Divya, you can, is your mic uh, unmuted? Can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Yes. Oh, so sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. So um, in that passage, godliness and reverence, it's uh, mentioned in verse 2. Uh, uh, that is, the, we might, while we read it, we'll just read it off and go. But uh, it has a lot of, uh, you know, essence over there. Uh, so we, uh, I felt like uh, right now I don't have a proper, you know, explanation. But uh, I felt like God wants us to um, really understand what he meant. Like when he says men... Uh, lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And also um, authority uh, that we need to respect, the people who are uh, kept in authorities. Uh, uh, so we know, especially during COVID times and things like that, there was such a lot of uh, reference to the scripture, uh, especially here and all. It was like people were not ready to wear masks people did not want to obey the authorities. So there were different opinions and it caused a lot of division actually even in the church. So uh, that is something that we obey the authorities in the Lord. That is what is um, something that uh, I was thinking is right. Uh, if it is going beyond what God is asking us to do, then we need to step back. But uh, yeah, we surely should respect the authorities that God has placed um, in, in, in our midst, a as well as um, the, I, I love the portion where Paul is kind of giving a resume of himself uh, in verse 5, where it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So it's kind of a resume that Paul is uh, just telling. And I love the fact how clear he is about his calling. He's just saying, uh, yeah, I am a preacher and an apostle. And he's presenting the gospel there so beautifully that he's just saying there's only one mediator. Uh, it's amazing. Very, very well written. Yeah. Of course, Holy Spirit breath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Yes, we need to submit to authorities. We learned this when we were uh, studying Romans, the book of Romans, Paul letter, Paul's letter uh, to the church at Rome. He says we need to submit to authorities, uh, but uh, submit to authorities to the extent where it does not go against the laws and the commands of what God has uh, given to us in his word. So at that time, we choose to obey what God asks us to do. But all other times we submit and uh, to, uh, to authority, we do what they ask us to do. Yes, thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights. Very valuable. Yes, Sayi? Yes, Pastor. Um, for me, um, it's from verse 1 to verse 4, uh, where Paul here counsels Timothy and I guess every one of us in part of the body of Christ, you know, to render supplication and prayers and intercessions for all men and then he now gives a detail of what he means by all men starting with kings which represent all those in authority basically our leaders presidents kings whatnot at various um, um levels of leadership in the nation or a country we find ourselves and for me the um I guess for me, the um, revelation I, I got from 
this scripture is that there is a link between the prayers of the saints and that's the church to the leaders of that land where they find themselves and the peace and tranquility they enjoy and experience and then most importantly and a link between also the the harvest of souls in that place so if we pray for our leaders it will lead to peace it will maintain the peace it will retain the peace within that nation even when there's turbulence when we still pray we can in the spirit you know um bring peace to the land and now in that peace we are now able to strategize and find ways to reach out to people so that they could be saved because god here wants all men to be saved at the end of the day and that goes to when again remember back in the early church when they were first in persecution and then when the persecution ceased, the church grew, you know, it's the same thing too. When there's peace in the land, you know, when we pray for our leaders to lead us right, and they're able to, you know, establish peace and do things in a way that would um, promote tranquility. We as the church can capitalize on that opportunity to reach out to many with the gospel. So there's a link with our prayer with the leaders, the leaders in the land, the peace that we enjoy, and then the harvest we're able to make into God's kingdom. I just thought uh, um, that's something I could share from um, 1 to 4 of chapter 2, verse first Timothy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sei. Well said. I think all of you uh, in this class are uh, excellent teachers and preachers. So I think I should give each of you a chapter to teach. <laughs> on first timothy and second timothy titus and philemon and i think i should sit back and learn from all of you the excellent uh, insights and truth thank you so much y'all y'all are going to just make great teachers and uh, preachers who are going to be better than any one of us yes elisha says one true god uh, yes thank you for pointing that very important Kennedy says, decency and contentment are important in christian life yes thank you well said uh, yes, the, we have Harrison, and then we'll go with Mangi. Yes, Harrison. All right. Um, I'm citing from verse 2 that says, For kings and all who are in the authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Then when you also read um, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11, it says, that you so also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So for me, one thing I'm trying to get, even from the message of Paul, is that when we are able to live a quiet life and we're able to mind our business, we kill hypocrisy, we kill gossiping, we kill backbiting, because the time you know you have you know minding your business, you will not be having the same time you know poknosing into other people's business. So when we look at what is happening in the church, is because people don't mind their business, and people are not living that peaceable and quiet life. So when we start paying attention to what Paul is teaching us, then we'll start getting things right with ourselves first before the church you know start getting things right because it starts from us first down to the church because we are the church and if we don't get things right about ourselves the church will have issues so that's one thing i want to share thank you thank you harrison very important point about uh, maintaining peace uh, you know uh, do what you can do to pursue peace the word of god says and uh, to keep the spirit of peace so peace is very important for even for god you know in, uh, in john chapter 17 jesus high priestly prayer he says father let them be one as we are one uh, so you rightly pointed out that you know uh, when we are busy uh, engaging in what god has called us to do we don't have time to gossip to backbite, to do other things because we just focus, there's so much to do. We just leave all of that to God. And when we do that, you know, uh, God would remove things that are going to hinder the peace because we are going, we are pursuing peace. And so it's so important rather than our egos are uh, that we are right, what we said is right, what we did is right, rather than fighting for that, you know, just maintaining peace and love. 
which is so important to keep the team, to keep the church, to keep the group, uh, the ministry uh, going. It's, this is very, very important. And uh, so as leaders, as people who are part of um, the church and leading teams or part of a team, we need to ensure that we maintain peace and togetherness and harmony and love. Thank you, Harrison. Mangi, over to you. Thank you, Fasa. Um, yeah, um, point of the mark raised a little bit different from uh, the blessed teachers. Um, what I found in this chapter is that there was a, a two way communication between Paul and, and Timothy. And Paul was responding to some questions that Tim Timothy uh, raised beforehand. Uh, for example, in verse 7, where he has to, to say that he's, he's not lying, he, he's speaking the truth. It's like he's trying to prove himself to be trustworthy because he's responding exactly like was the communication before. And second thing is on uh, the woman not being able to teach. He's just responding to the question that Timothy asked. And I feel like the, those verses will not be taken just a verse alone. We need to understand the whole concept concept and why he's saying that. Um, also, on a woman who would be saved by childbearing if they continue in faith. But every believer uh, would be saved by faith. And if no one believe, believe or doesn't have faith, they will not be saved. So, yeah, we should take the whole chapter and the whole book as one to big idea instead of, of, of just one, one verse. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mangi. Uh, well said. Uh, yes, we need to not just interpret scripture, uh, uh, just as we see it or read it, uh, at face value but interpret scripture in the light of the rest of other scripture as one point you mentioned yes and also paul is writing to timothy based on information that he has received or heard from people who may have traveled from ephesus to macedonia where paul is writing uh, to timothy or also may have received a letter from timothy uh, so he's writing uh, to encourage him uh, and also to you know talk about various issues the church is facing and how to handle that yes right uh, thank you mangi uh, yes christopher oh uh, yes uh, thank you pastor so uh, i was just actually just uh, thinking through this this point about uh, uh, you know the uh, praying and and uh, you know doing supplications and giving of thanks for people in civil authority and uh, as I was going through also your notes, uh, you know, you have mentioned about uh, that, you know, in this current time, the, the Emperor Nero was actually the emperor and uh, he was um, very much, um, you know, against the Christians and um, also um, was persecuting, persecuting them. In fact, he was the one, as, as per your notes, he was also the one who, who uh, had uh, all beheaded and had uh, Peter crucified. So I'm just thinking that, um, uh, I mean, if you look in look at in, in the current time and how we can apply this, um, uh, there may be, uh, you know, situations or, you know, uh, governments or you know, people in civil authority who are, uh, you know, there to, you know, to, to, to persecute, to, 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 you know, to really uh, uh, go after uh, Christians. So, I guess my question is, you know, um, praying is is there, but do we still sort of, you know, um, live in that in that uh, in that environment of of persecution, and um, uh, or do we have to, you know, uh, try and uh, uh, you know do something about it, you know, besides the praying and uh, you know um, living in godliness. So uh, I guess that is the question I have, and um, and recently I'm just to just to point out, um, you know, I've, I've been also you know doing a little bit of uh, research on you know uh, the state of Israel and how they are, uh, you know, how they also are you know in a situation where they are you know a small nation that are that is that is uh, sitting uh, right uh, among all the other nations that are that a lot of them are against them, and they have basically. Uh, 
you know they're showing a lot of showing a lot of strength to ensure that you know that, that they are not um, uh, you know uh, not not only just persecuted but also you know attacked so uh, just trying to understand you know this this what what is there in the in, in this bible uh, scripture and how it applies in, in the current uh, current times thank you christopher uh, for your question oh it's time for a break now we'll go for a break and then after we come back from our break we'll uh, first begin with answering christopher's uh, questions and then we'll continue looking at uh, our study of each verse in first timothy chapter 2 okay so we'll go for our break thank you everyone see you